Good morning, Mission Church, and a happy 4th of July. Thank you for joining us. What a blessing it is to live in this country where we have the freedom to um, proclaim God's Word openly. And I'm excited that you joined us on this busy and festive weekend. And I'm excited about this new series of messages, brief series that we're going to share through the month of July. And I'll be teaming with Pastor Woody on this. Well, our pastor takes a little break, well-deserved, and uh, we're just so thankful for his ministry to us, and I hope this will be an encouragement uh, to you and also to him. So I want to encourage you to take your Bibles with me. We're going to turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7 this morning, and the series is entitled, Does the Bible Really Say That? <laughs> and I'm excited about it because we're actually going to be dealing with some popular axioms, if you will, or uh, sayings that can come off as biblical in proportion. But we got to ask ourselves, is that really what the Bible teaches? And so I want to do that uh, starting this morning, and I hope it'll be of practical help to you and benefit to you. Maybe you've heard some of these sayings like, um, God helps those who help themselves. Or cleanliness is next to godliness. Or money is the root of all evil. Or how about this one? God will never give you more than you can handle. <laughs> or never judge others. Or good people go to heaven. Is that really what the Bible says? Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what's the big deal? Would you really take precious time, preaching time, to address what, at the very least, are well-intended messages? Well, with God's help, I want to try to answer that question today and briefly deal with one of those popular sayings. I think it's important that we understand a couple things up front. Firstly, Jesus admonishes us to take his word seriously and carefully. Here in Matthew chapter 7, uh, we're jumping into the latter portion of what many refer to as the greatest sermon ever preached. And of course, it's the greatest sermon ever preached because it was preached by the greatest person ever, and that is the God-man, Christ Jesus. In Matthew chapter 7, uh, we're going to read some verses, but it's at the tail end of this message where he's begun by teaching people how to live a happy life. And then he addresses his own relationship to the Old Testament law. He deals with practical matters like anger, lust, divorce, oaths, retaliation, how to treat your enemies, how to help the needy, how to pray, he deals with the, air, the issue of materialism and giving to God. Talks about anxiety, judging others, the golden rule, and discernment. And then he concludes his message with these verses. Notice with me, beginning with verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority 
and not as the scribes. Hey, listen. Scripture teaches us that Jesus himself is the living word. He is the logos. He is 100% God. And what he says is the very word of God. He also quoted the scriptures that were already written and available to men when he walked this earth. And he was careful with the scriptures. In doing that, he modeled reverence and respect. The same reverence and respect that we should have for God's written word. We call it the Bible. You've probably heard this week the reports of a tragic event near Miami, Florida, the collapse of the 12-story Chamberlain Tower, the South Condominium. According to a report this very week in the AP, 20 residents have been found dead, 180 still missing. And sadly, no one has been rescued since the early hours of that fateful morning. The cause of the collapse is still under investigation, but according to the article, it says in 2018, there was an engineering report that the building's ground floor pool deck was resting on a concrete slab and had, quote, major structural damage, end quote, and needed extensive repairs. The report also found, and I quote, abundant cracking of concrete columns, beams, and walls in the underground parking garage. Just two months ago, the president of the building's condo wrote a letter to the residents saying that structural problems identified in the 2018 inspection had gotten, quote, significantly worse and that major repairs would cost upwards of $15.5 million. Bids for the work were pending when the building suddenly collapsed. I, I can't think of a more vivid and contemporary illustration to powerfully remind us of the importance of building on a solid foundation. Jesus talks about that. And the context of that is His very Word. Some of us that grew up in church can remember singing that song that kind of became a cute little story about building our house on the rock or building our house on the sand and building our life on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's, that's a great song for us to teach and to learn and to sing. But I think perhaps it's kind of put within us the attitude that this is a cute little quip or story. And we miss the point. Jesus is talking about His very words and how we need to carefully build our lives on His words. Jesus is solemnly warning us of the danger of disregarding or taking lightly what really matters to Him. What, why is this a big deal? Because Jesus is committed to every bit of truth, as should we. We need to get it right. What He says, we should not edit it or accommodate our attitudes or wishes. So let's look at those expressions again for a minute. Do you see them there? There's something common in all of these misquotes of the Bible. There's just enough truth within each statement to make them dangerous. I had a teacher in college who used to say a deep voice and in a very slow um, rhythm. He said, the greatest form of error is truth mixed with error. He's right. And the people who heard Jesus on the Mount that day were astonished at his teaching. Why? The scripture says, because he spoke as one who had authority. Of course he did. He is God come in the flesh. He was speaking the word of God. And he's reminding us how important it is. He said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. 
Every word is important and should be heeded carefully. Look with me at Matthew chapter 5, earlier in the sermon, where he's talking about his relationship with the law, the Old Testament. Notice in verses 17 to 19, he says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, listen to this, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. This is, this is not really a small matter. Why are you nitpicking? Because this is the word of God. We shouldn't treat it lightly or flippantly. We shouldn't, shouldn't misquote it. We shouldn't attribute worldly thinking to a holy God. Jesus came to give us life, to give us abundant life. The enemy of our soul, Satan, comes to steal, kill, and destroy, the Word of God says. He wants to rob us of the light and life that God's Word brings. Satan probably knows the Bible better than any of us in this room this morning. He even quoted it. He had the audacity to quote the Word of God to Jesus, trying to get Him to do something wrong. And our Lord answered Him with the truth of Scripture correctly. Yes, here's the truth. He knows the Word a lot better than Satan. <laughs> Aren't you grateful for that? You can go all the way back to the Garden of Eden and see that that was the strategy of our enemy, and it still is. Change the Word of God. Manipulate it. Edit it. Put other ideas into the heart of men. Remember, that's what he did in the Garden. He says he was more subtle than any beast in the Garden. God had specifically commanded Adam to do what? To not eat of one tree in the garden, the knowledge of good and evil. Well, the Lord gave Adam a helpmeet, Eve, and together they enjoyed the beautiful garden and all that God had provided there. There was one restriction, that one tree. And you might remember that when the Satan, Satan came to Eve to tempt her. He said, Hath God said, and that's still a strategy. Let's change the word. Maybe he meant something else. But that put a thought in her mind because it's very interesting what she did. She says, Yes, the Lord told us to not eat that of that tree, to not even touch it. <laughs> now, uh, let's give her a little bit of leeway. Perhaps Adam said, Probably be a good idea not to touch it. But God never said that, that we know of. And you know, that's what Satan does. He gets us to, to say other things that are not in the scriptures to get us away from God's will, to think differently about God than as revealed in his word. That's been his strategy, and it is today. So that's why we make it a big deal, because it's a big deal to God. Which brings us to the first of our four statements this morning that I want to deal with in the, in the minutes that remain. Here it is. Just... Follow your heart. <laughs> have you ever had someone tell you that? Hey, have you ever said that to someone else? Follow your heart. It's popular in the movies, novels, slogans, blogs, memes. Oftentimes it means uh, trust yourself. Follow your instincts. Maybe you've put it, heard it put this way. Your heart will never lead you astray. Is that true? The problem is that none of these quips are from the Bible, nor are they supported by the Bible. It starts innocently enough, even at a young age. Have you ever watched a Disney animation? <laughs> Many of those encourage our children to follow their hearts against their parents, against what everyone else is saying. Just follow your heart. Goes way back to the 40s. Jiminy Cricket, let your conscience be your guide. Listen, 
That's Jiminy Cricket, not Jesus Christ. The Prince of Peace. Rather than falling to the temptation to shape God into our image with popular axioms, we need the Word, the true Word of God. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Notice the order there. Desire, delight in the Lord. So what's the big idea this morning? Here it is. Make it your focus to delight in God. Let His Word shape your heart and go with Him. So how do we let God's Word shape our heart? Number one, let God's Word, let the Bible define your heart. And when someone says, hey, Bill, man, just, just follow your heart, Bill. Hey, Susan, girlfriend, you, you got to follow your heart on this one. What are they talking about? We need to define the heart. And that's the first important challenge of this mantra that is so prevalent in our culture. Uh, someone shared, I don't watch the show myself, but someone told me that there's a very popular show, Bachelor, and that that's pr a prevalent mantra on the show Bachelor. Well, okay, go figure, right? Um, like Forrest Gump said, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, <laughs> um, in our culture, Heart is emotion, feeling, instinct, passion, desire. And if we don't get a better and more complete definition of this important term, we'll find ourselves in a lot of trouble if we follow our heart. Uh, there's a story that's told of two experienced bear hunters and a friend who wanted to learn how to, to, to bear hunt. At the end of the first day, one of the experienced bear hunters brought back a large grizzly bear. <laughs> The experienced bear hunter asked how the bear was bagged, and the successful hunter exclaimed, I followed the tracks, I went into the cave, and I shot the deer. The next day, the three hunters went after some more bears. At the end of the day, the second experienced hunter dragged back a black bear into the camp, and when asked how he had shot the black bear, he, he expressed, I followed the tracks, into the cave, and then I shot the bear. Well, the third day, the three hunters went out and returned, and at the end of the day, neither of the experienced hunters had gotten a bear. And when the inexperienced bear hunter returned to the camp, he had no bear, but he was all cut up and bloody. The two other hunters said, hey, what happened? To which the inexperienced hunter explained, I too followed the tracks. I went into the cave and I got hit by a train. <laughs> okay, here's the problem. No one had ever defined the tracks. And I'm afraid we throw out these expressions like follow your heart, but we don't have a clear definition of what that is. So where do we get it? We get it in the Bible. Thank God the Bible doesn't work that way. Okay, God doesn't leave us to define it. He gives it for us in His Word. He never told us to follow our heart, but He has defined the heart in His Word. And we need to let God's Word define our hearts. The Bible mentions the word heart about a thousand times. And for thousands of years in Jewish history, God's people have expressed their devotion to God with these familiar words. We call it the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your might. This is again repeated in Matthew's gospel when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? You need to understand something. The Old Testament word translated heart, sometimes pr pronounced lebab, more often than not, it's shortened to a three-letter word, lab, or leb. Different cultures throughout the centuries have had different ideas about the, how the human body works. And this is certainly true with the, the Israelite ancient Hebrew writers of the Bible. 
I think they knew that there was a vital organ in the chest that sustained a person's life. I think a good example of that in the Old Testament is the character of Nabal, the man who mistreated David's servants in 1 Samuel 25. He, I think, was stricken with a heart attack. The scripture says that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And we know in that particular case, he didn't die for 10 more days and God delivered him with a, a stroke. So I think the people were aware of this vital organ at the center of a man's being which sustained his life and thus the word heart became the center of man. There was no word at that point for brain. They spoke of the heart in many ways that, mean, that seemed kind of strange to us as readers because they had very little concept of the brain and its function. The Old Testament word, heart and mind, interact. They're used together. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The heart is where you understand. Proverbs 14, 33 says, Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding. The heart is where you discern truth from error. That's what Solomon asked for. You remember, God came to him and said, you can have anything you ask, just ask me. And he asked in 1 Kings 3 and verse 9, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil, for who is able to govern this your great people? So in the Old Testament times, the heart is where you think and make sense of the world. It's where you feel emotions. You can feel pain in your heart when going through something emotional. Think of Hannah. Do you remember? She so desired to have a, a baby and she was infertile and her husband was trying to minister to her there in the temple and she was being mocked by her husband's other wife. And, and in a very awkward moment, 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 8, he asks his wife, why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad? Now that's where he should have stopped, okay? He was sensitive to that point, but then he had to keep talking and he said, am I not more to you than 10 sons? <laughs> nice try, big boy, right? <laughs> kind of blew it there. But he had it right. Her heart was sad. It's from the ancient Hebrews writers that we get the term broken heart. You can experience fear in your heart. It can melt. It can feel distressed or even depressed. On the other side, it's the center of joy. The word heart literally means or happy in the Hebrew has the idea of a good heart. So the heart is a generator of physical life. It's the center of intellectual and emotional life, but it's also the seat of volitional life where we make choices. We're motivated by our desires, the desires of the heart. It's that which pushes you to do something. In fact, it's interesting. I, I, I searched and I found one place in the scripture where you might say someone said, follow your heart. It's in 2 Samuel 7 when David is talking with Nathan the prophet and his desire to build a house for God. And he chose a great friend in Nathan, a man of God. And you know what his friend said to him? Go do what your heart's telling you to do. Okay, so there you go. If you want to use that as justification. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. The New Testament word heart is cardia, from which we get the word, obviously, cardiologist. It's used to describe the physical heart. But it's used figuratively throughout the New Testament to speak of the mind, the emotions, and the will of man, just like the Old Testament. There's a consistency there. In essence, then, the Bible defines the heart as the center of human existence. Your mind, your emotions, your will. Or if you, you could put it this way, the real you. The you that dwells in the body. Loving God with one's heart was not speaking merely of emotion, but keeping one's mind and thoughts directed and working for God. We need to keep that in mind when we say, follow your heart. 
We need to qualify that. The heart's not defined as sappy emotionalism or feeling, but rather the spiritual center of our beings, our core. So with that definition, in order to get God's word to shape our hearts, we must also consider how the Bible describes our heart. It's here where we begin to understand why the Bible never tells us to follow our heart. How is this core of, of us as men and women, boys and girls, how's that described in the scripture? And I think with this description, we're going to find out it doesn't support the idea of one following his heart. The prophet Jeremiah, speaking God's word, describes the heart as fundamentally broken. He said in chapter 17 and verse 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The prophet had watched a whole generation turn away from God to the point that they were even sacrificing their children as if it were a good thing. Sounds familiar. This is why in the imagination of the Hebrew prophets, the only hope for humanity was the total renewal of the heart. Moses predicted that if Israel would ever love their God with all their heart, they would need their hearts circumcised. Wow, that's radical language. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Very vivid. But it speaks of removing evil and stubbornness from our hearts. Rebellion. Ezekiel the prophet hoped for a day when God would remove this heart of stone and give his people a new heart of soft flesh. Very similar to Jeremiah's hope that God would write the commandments of the Torah on the hearts of God's people. Friends, this, this possibility of a new heart was provided in Jesus through new birth. Jesus tells us in John 3 and verse 3, we must be born again. We need a new heart. We must be born spiritually. It's here where he gives us this new heart. I love this, this verse, Romans 10 verses 9 and 10 tell us that if we come in our sinfulness and quote, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. For with the heart, man believes to righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. When we repent of our sinfulness, our stubbornness, our waywardness, and we trust Jesus as our only Savior, in Him we become a new creature, the Bible says. The power of the Holy Spirit who gives us new life changes our hearts from being sin-focused to being God-focused. Now, instead of our way, it's His way. Romans 12, verses 10 and 11 say, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. This new life in Christ, rising us from the dead, now giving us the power to make right choices, choices that please him, doing his will, following His commands for His glory. Friend, have you come just as you are with your heart, just as it is, rebellious, wayward, hard? And have you acknowledged your need for a new heart, a clean heart, a soft heart? Believe with your heart today. Believe with your whole being the gospel, that Christ died for your sins, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day to give you life. Trust him today. This brings me to the last thought about God's word shaping our hearts. Very quickly, notice this third thing. Let God's word direct your heart. Don't follow your heart. Trust in the Lord. 
with all your heart. What does that look like? Well, Proverbs 3, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. <laughs> How much of that goes into follow your heart? In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your past. Can I just simplify it in two points from the scripture? Don't trust yourself, not even your heart. As you're considering your direction in this matter, what are you going to do? Follow your heart is most often used when you're, you know, trying to find out, figure out what, where you're going to go, what you're going to do, who you're going to marry, what job you're going to get, where you're going to live, how are you going to deal in a relationship? Someone says, follow your heart. Careful. You may have good intentions, but God always has the best intentions. Let me go back to that story of David. I want to build a house for God. He was sitting in his beautiful palace, lined with cedar, paneled with cedar. And he said, I sit in this beautiful house and, and God dwells in a tent. What a shame. I want to build him a house. So he tells his good friend, man of God even, he has great intentions. And initially his friend says, hey, if that's in your heart, Dave, do it. Well, here's the rest of the story. Nathan goes back to his house. And that very night, God comes to Nathan the prophet and says, ah, you need to go back to the king and you need to tell him, no, it's not going to be you building the house. I've got other plans. That was the word in a nutshell. Aren't you grateful David had the right kind of friend? Man of God. Man who listened to the voice of God and was willing to approach his king friend with God's truth. David had great intentions. But he told David, can't do this. God has spoken. <laughs> Listen, I, I want to encourage you. Choose the right friends. <laughs> That's practical advice. Choose your friends carefully and make sure their advice is consistent with God's. And then it says, in all your ways, in all your considerations, in all your plans, in all your decisions, acknowledge Him. Don't just wink. Just give Him a little nod of the head. I gave you some time, Jesus. No, no, no. Seek it out. You know, sometimes we follow the heart and we, we make decisions too quickly. Maybe we just need to learn to wait. Find out what God says on the matter. Choose your counselors carefully. Make sure their advice is consistent and be willing to wait. Honor God. Seek Him first. Love Him first. And the scripture says, He will direct your paths. He'll always lead you into the right situation, and He will be glorified. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for its wisdom. Lord, we want You to define the heart. We want, you, we want to accept Your description of the heart. And then, Lord, we need our hearts directed. We need Your direction. Help us to be wise and understanding what the will, your will, the will of the Lord is. And then, Lord, help us to your glory to do it. Forgive us where we've made choices in the flesh to follow our hearts in opposition to your clear word. Give us courage to do what is right. And we'll thank you for the blessings that come. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.